All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to welcome you to this uh, webinar. I'm really excited to be hosting uh, Alex Kutu and Don Balat again uh, from Rosa uh, and have them sort of give us an update on where they're at with their application. Uh, you know, certainly in the world of exploration, you know, there is a need to get results that are better in a safer way, in a faster way. And, and I think even more importantly now, in a way that really sort of respects the idea of whole ESG and low carbon economy that we're entering into. It's going to be very important that we, you know, promote technologies that are going to lead us in that direction. So I'm really excited to host uh, Rosa for this webinar. Before we jump into the Rosa presentation, I would like to just let everybody here know that, uh, look, if you would like to ask any questions, please type them in the chat box. Just type them in the chat box and we'll be able to address those questions uh, uh, near the end of the webinar. Or some of those questions may be answered by John and Alex as they're doing their presentation. Uh, but certainly at the end of, by the end of the presentation, we're going to... Um, able to send you a copy of the presentation deck itself and we'll also give you a link uh, to the recording of this webinar. So without any further ado, I'd like to hand it over to John and Alex. John, please go ahead. Thank you, Charles. Hi, everyone. My name is John Balatbat. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Roser and welcome to the Future of Exploration. I'm joined with our CEO, Alex Kotu, and we'll be presenting a better, safer, faster way of acquiring geophysical data. Hello everyone for our agenda today. We'll start with an overview of present day exploration, looking into current gaps in the discovery phase of mining projects and the kind of impact it has downstream. From there, we'll get into the future of exploration, showcasing emerging technology specialized in data acquisition and providing a deeper comparison to traditional methods. Make sure to stick around for the end for a special announcement on how you can be a part of the future of exploration. We're excited to take questions that you may have at the end of the webinar, so please feel free to send them our way in the chat as they come to mind. Now, on to the presentation. So exploration to this day has experienced tremendous growth, largely due to the capabilities traditional aircraft have in conducting airborne surveys. So as the number of airborne surveys increase, so do the complications it has during and post acquisition. So in the initial phase of discovery, large mineral exploration initiatives have utilized traditional aircraft platforms such as helicopters and airplanes to conduct the first round of airborne surveillance. These surveys cover large areas of interest that require anywhere from one to tens of thousands of inline kilometers. The surveys include onboarding sensors such as magnetic, electromagnetic, radiometric, and many others. However, when integrated onto traditional aircraft, the performance of its readings decline due to the aircraft's requirement to fly at higher altitudes, a large buffer zone between aircraft and the ground to maintain a safe distance for pilots. And so this trade-off directly affects the resolution of data acquired. Flying further away from the target means losing valuable insight into what lies beneath. So low, resol uh, re low resolution data often necessitates a further investigation with ground level scans, a challenging and time consuming process that prolongs the initial phase of discovery. If there are less obvious deposits within specific areas of land, those deposits can be left unnoticed with low resolution traditional aircraft scans, which are less likely to be investigated further by ground. So this presents a serious concern for those involved as this can present huge opportunity costs. Let's take a deeper dive on traditional aircraft and compare it to its uh, and compare its features to the prevailing alternative of remotely piloted aircraft systems or RPAS for short. Uh, at this point in time, traditional aircraft have been the dominating platform for data acquisition and with good reason. There are certain specifications that cannot be beat by alternatives, including uh, coverage and payload capacity for sensors. Uh, for most applications in mineral exploration, it makes sense to deploy traditional aircraft more often than RPAS. However, as mentioned before, there are drawbacks to this platform, which cannot be overlooked like resolution and turnaround times. But what happens downstream should also be closely looked at. Pilot safety. 
the environment. And downstream costs are important factors to list out when considering traditional aircraft. Being that there are no alternatives that can address these concerns in an effective manner, we're situated with the following. So starting with safety hazards, posing great risk to its operators, making data acquisition a much more dangerous job than it needs to be. It's challenging to fly at low heights and at slow speeds, especially when situated in rough terrain. But we should avoid putting pilots in these situations, and there should be a better alternative to promote safer working conditions. Next is environmental damage. So typical small airplanes such as the King Air, Navajo, and Cessna 208, or small helicopters such as the Bell 206, MD500D, and AS350 used in mineral exploration within these larger survey category produce approximately 1,500 to 3,000 metric tons of CO2 per year on fuel alone. There's also the negative impact from manufacturing and disposal of traditional aircrafts. And with all of this contributing to the sharp increase in scope three emissions, which is the largest group that produces GHG emissions, not just in mining, but in many other industries. Now, in addition to climate impact, there's the high cost and time wasted in post-processing and analysis of low resolution traditional aircraft survey data. Geophysicists who analyze the data are in short supply and very much in demand, which makes their service come at a great cost. So having to analyze the data, not only from in the air, but also on the ground further compounds the problem. And this makes for a very expensive and time consuming investigation. The question is, how do we solve these issues? With rapidly deployable operational crews that utilize long range RPAS capable of flying lower to the ground and closer to their point of interest, these specialized systems are able to yield high resolution data, even comparable to ground level surveys. Currently in our case, we focus primarily on magnetic data with a single onboard magnetometer. With our specialized remotely piloted aircraft systems that are lightweight and much more maneuverable, these systems are capable of flying as low as possible to the ground with a minimal buffer. Flying lower to the target of interest gains the lost potential experienced with traditional aircraft. Then by acquiring high resolution data at ground level quality, this removes the need for further ground level scans and the secondary accompanying post-processing and analysis from geophysicists. With our long range systems, large survey areas can be completed efficiently with project sizes typically between 1,000 to 10,000 inline kilometers. With, quali with fully qualified operational RPAS crews ready to roll out at a moment's notice in combination with vertical takeoff and landing systems that don't require full runways for takeoff and landing, deploying specialized RPAS is very fast and more operationally flexible. Even more importantly, with only one scan required for the entire investigation, data acquisition is, of course, much faster. In addition, there's the benefit of less post-processing and analysis, making the overall investigation that much faster. So in our latest case study, we compare a 200 kilometer total magnetic intensity survey flown by a Navajo PA-31. Here's a sample of the resulting magnetic data. Now, here's the same survey area flown by our specialized system with that single magnetometer sensor. The flight produced better resolution over the previous traditional aircraft survey. Our system completed 200 kilometers in approximately two hours flight time. It did so at 23 meters per second with 50 meter line spacing. It was fully electric and therefore emission free. And of course, it was remotely piloted. So no air, no pilot on board. Now, our specialized RPAS are not to be confused with typical small multi-rotor RPAS that are commonly seen in the geophysical space for small surveys that cover less than a few hundred kilometers. Our survey crews are able to cover much larger areas with specialized RPAS that can fly 
over 100 kilometers per flight and quickly get back in the air with hot swappable battery packs. This provides our crews with the ability to take on larger exploration survey sizes between 1,000 to 10,000 inline kilometers. So in comparing specialized systems with other fixed wing r pass in the aeromagnetic space, I uh, highlight other fixed wings. These models tend to produce highly filtered data results due to the high signal to noise ratio during data acquisition. These electric aircraft systems produce their own electromagnetic field, which introduces noise into the magnetic readings. These are, of course, measured by flux gate systems, and that data is used to compensate during post-processing. Now, our specialized systems are fully capable of supporting external sensors in a bird setup to our aircraft, which allows for separation between the sensors and noise producing motors. The separation escapes the noise and produces raw leg data that remains less altered to give clients true readings into their survey areas. Now for downstream impact, deploying specialized systems introduces great benefits downstream, promoting pilot safety, a cleaner environment, and less additional costs down the road. Let's take a closer look into how these systems intend to do this. So remote navigation. Operating conditions are much safer as remotely piloted aircraft systems remove the pilot from the aircraft, thereby removing the most dangerous type of flight, low altitude flight. For the environment, the specialized systems have a net zero emission during acquisition, creating a greener alternative for mining companies and reducing their scope three emissions. Lastly, these high resolution scans are able of, are capable of reducing costs by eliminating unnecessary secondary ground level scans due to the optimized performance during flight. In addition, the need for secondary survey post-processing and analysis from expensive geophysicists is removed, which in turn decreases the amount of investigation time overall. Great, now that you've heard about the future of exploration, let's get into how one can be a part of it. So if you're interested in achieving better resolution, safer acquisition and faster results, then we've got something exciting lined up for you. So see our specialized systems in action and experience this innovation firsthand. As a first step, we'll get the conversation started clarify any further questions as needed and offer a one-on-one -on -one to go over what these demo projects could look like for you. So bring up your specific needs and we'd love to discuss it in further detail. So for example, integrating sensors to test performance and substituting traditional aircraft for surveying to compare results. So whether your mining companies looking for a better alternative in conducting mineral exploration, airborne surveyors and geoscience firms interested in onboarding cost-efficient platforms to reduce operational costs, sensor manufacturers searching for the right platform to integrate their technology, or even outside the mining industry, those that have the perfect application and are curious about specialized RPAs like ours and how it can benefit their operations, all mentioned are a great fit for taking that first step. All right, so as an overview of the demo projects, we'll be implementing these into two parts, integration and exploration. We'll be onboarding our specialized remotely piloted aircraft systems and conduct exploration initiatives with you to provide a hands-on experience where you can see the benefits of the implementation firsthand. Now we want to keep these projects as open as possible to work on what you are building towards. So here are some general suggestions that we've come up with as to how these can look like. Now, we're rolling this out in the spring, so join in on this opportunity to see the future firsthand for your company. As spots fill, newer projects will be pushed out, so make sure to reach out sooner than later to secure your timeline. All right, that concludes our presentation on the future of exploration. We'll now take up your questions from the chat. Thank you, everyone. All right, uh, Don and uh, Alex, we do have a question in the chat. 
Um, I want to just open up the floor again to everybody. If you have a question you'd like to ask um, by asking verbally, please uh, hit the reactions button and put up your hand and we'll be able to see your hand up and we can unmute your mic so that you can uh, ask your question uh, directly. Uh, but there is a question here from Mark Baldi. And uh, the question we have here is, uh, again, thank you for showing uh, the test flight results. Which sensor was used uh, for the test flight? And also what is the limit, uh, weight limit for your aircraft? Absolutely. So that magnetometer specifically was the Geometrics Mag Aero. Um, we modified it to integrate it with our uh, VTOL system that really does travel further. Um, but the weight limit on our aircraft is four kilograms. It's more specialized for a single sensor system, but uh, we do have possible engineering for multi-sensor systems on another platform. Thank you for that answer. Um, uh, question, my question here is, um, I think uh, Alex, you, you guys may have addressed this somewhat, but maybe you can for some more clarification. Um, how do you, how, how is your set, how is your technology different from the drone technology already in place? Just maybe to clarify that point again. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So um, it's a vertical takeoff and landing fixed wing aircraft. Very different from the traditional multi-rotor setups that you typically see really anywhere, whether it's film, photogrammetry, or in the ge geophysical sp space. Really the advantages that we have on that is that we have a higher payload capacity as well as a longer range that travels further and faster so okay. thank you for that Alex another question here is um, in terms of um, dealing with line of sight requirements uh, how does your aircraft sort of deal with that whole remote piloting piece absolutely another great question um, so this current system maximizes on that visual line of sight when you're, when you're flying a sort of lawnmower type pattern, um, going from north to south, north to south, it actually does cover quite a long distance if you're traveling as far out as two kilometers from your ground station and that um, remote pilot. So with that radius you actually cover a grid of approximately 100 kilometers distance so this system was designed to maximize that visual line of sight but in specialized applications where we are needed to go beyond visual line of sight we do have a full operations team and process that's capable of beyond visual line of sight flight it just requires a, a few more certifications granted by Transport Canada, of which we have many of the operations, the manuals required, all the paperwork, so that we can properly go through with acquiring those certifications. Okay, Alex, this is a follow-up question to that. Can you just maybe mention on range, the distance, maximum distance you can travel as well? Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, it's 100 kilometers per flight, okay. but that's very, quickly swapped with another set of batteries to get in the air right after that. So we, uh, we look to travel closer to um, seven to 800 kilometers per day. Gotcha, thank you. Okay, a question from Paul. Uh, wondering what sort of heights you fly, also what sorts of weather you can handle and what software or uh, what does your data format look like? Yeah, absolutely. So um, really we fly as low as possible. We try to maintain about a 15 meter buffer between ourselves and the nearest surface. So whether or not your application is in a more challenging terrain that's sort of mountainous, uh, we, have a, uh, we have a great drape quality on our aircraft that navigates very well. So whether we're trying to just skim over trees, right, we maintain that sort of 15 meter buffer above those trees. But there are instances where, for instance, you have a flat ground. It's much easier to do that. So we would really be flying much closer to the ground and that point of interest to maintain that, that sort of 15 meter separation. And uh, what sort of weather can we handle? Um, we fly between negative 10 to 40 degrees C. We fly in uh, light rain, 
um, and then winds that don't exceed 35 kilometers per hour. Um, the software we use, it's um, our navigation software. We use a few different suites depending on the application. Really, it, um, it depends on a few things and, and that range. So it's, it's best to discuss with us what your application is and we can properly um, set you up with the right software or our operational crews with that software for your application. And then um, the format of our data. So um, we'll always pull out our data in a format that our geophysicists are able to work with um, that comes in CSV files. Really, it could be anything. It depends on the geophysicist. Um, but we offer with our network of geophysicists full data analysis after our acquisition, if that's required from uh, from that work, our, excuse me, from our client. Okay, thank you for that, Alex. Uh, just as a follow up question to that, I think you mentioned a little bit about the weather, but if you can maybe more specifically talk about those wind conditions and altitude, how does your technology work in those areas? And the other part of the question is, can you just maybe mention about do you utilize technologies like collision avoidance in your, in your systems? Yeah, absolutely. So our uh, collision avoidance system, um, we use a range, a LIDAR range finder to drape the surface as accurately as possible. So with full terrain following, we're able to fly lower and, uh, and faster. Um, as for altitude, of course, it is much lower, right? We do try to maintain that low altitude really minimizing that buffer as much as possible. And for wind conditions, again, it's um, anywhere below 35 kilometers per hour. We don't want to exceed um, any wind gusts that um, that may go above that maximum. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, the next question is a little bit long, so I'll read it out so that uh, everybody can hear it. Uh, so the question is from Mark, and the question is, I have used UAS magnetic platforms in very remote areas that do not have high resolution BEM data. Uh, this service can require a separate high resolution LIDAR uh, type survey in order to help the navigation of aircraft. Does your system require the same high resolution dam to plan your surveys? So um, there's a few different approaches to the situation. Um, you can have a high resolution, say, uh, regal type LIDAR system where you run a higher scan, get your di digital elevation model, and then use that acquired model to then fly further flights with uh, aeromagnetic. But we actually choose to use our rangefinder in real time so that we can navigate our, um, um, our terrain accordingly. Um, I can say that it has um, quite good um, ve vegetation penetration, but this uh, this is a still a work in progress. So um, at times it may be more beneficial to use SRTM data. Um, so with that, uh, I'd love to follow up with you, and um, if you do have an application in mind, um, discuss that further after the after the call. Thank you very much, Alex. Okay, the next question we have is from Richard. And the question is, how do you remove the requirement for geophysicists to interpret the data? So um, we don't remove the requirement altogether. We remove so in secondary surveys. So um, just, to, just to really make that point clear, because we have high resolution data, further investigation on the ground is not required, right? We, uh, with our UAS, they're able to fly it closer to our points of interest, are able to provide relatively close data to what you would get on the ground anyways. So it's removing that second level of um, geophysical interpretation with, without the need of running that second survey at all. Okay, I'm looking at the question box. I don't see any new questions. Um, maybe if I can just ask uh, Alex and uh, and Juan again, you know, if people want to acquire the services of Rosa, um, what would be the, the, the quickest way for them to to reach out to you? Um, is it through your website or is it through email? What would be the, the, the 
process for two weeks. Uh, yeah, I can uh, I can address that. So uh, we'll be sending out these slides to everyone that's joined, everyone that's registered. Uh, my email will be on there, um, and that's the best way to contact us. Um, we also have uh, that option on our website. So if you go on roser.ca, there will be an email tab there where you can also contact us. Um, but LinkedIn works as well uh, if you're uh, if you use that platform. Um, so those would be the best ways to follow up with us, but we'll also be doing our rounds of follow-ups to, to reach out. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Hey, I have another question here uh, concerning uh, the GSG emissions and sort of the whole carbon accounting piece. Um, and that kind of comes from the idea of the SCOP3 emissions. Can you just comment on how your technology you know, offers maybe less of, a, of, a, of an impact on the environment? Absolutely. So um, it's, it's simple. We don't use jet fuel in order to power our aircrafts. We use electric systems. Um, with our electric motors, it's just batteries that are coming in, um, which of course offer much less of a CO2 emission. Um, and as, I, as we mentioned before, um, that yearly emission rate that you see in these larger aircraft is quite high. So um, there's a large potential for us to eliminate for you. Um, so there you have it. Okay, thank you for that answer. All right, I don't see any other questions in the chat box. Um, maybe what I can do now, oh, there is one question coming up, there you go. Okay, question from Patrick. Um, uh, I guess it's just thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation, guys, from, uh, from Patrick. Uh, yeah, you. thank you, Patrick, for your comment. <laughs> <laughs> there you so, go, very good. very good. I look forward to it. All right. All right, maybe we'll give it another couple of seconds for anyone else who wants to maybe ask a question. Uh, feel free to put your hand up, ask it directly. Um, but if there's no other questions, I'll ask Alex and uh, John to maybe just give us some closing remarks uh, before we say goodbye to everybody. Uh, Alex, go ahead. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you here today. So thank you for listening to the presentation. We hope to talk to you soon. Awesome, all right. Okay, everybody, thank you so much for coming to the presentation. As John said, we will be sending you a copy of the slides right afterwards, uh, along with a copy of the a link to the video. Okay, have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Bye.